Welcome to the first Academy Dialogues. My name is Sean Finney from the Member Relations Department. Academy Dialogues is a new series of online conversations hosted by the Academy. It begins today with the power of narrative, a conversation between Academy Governor Whoopi Goldberg and civil rights lawyer Brian Stevenson, founder and executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative. They'll be discussing Hollywood's historic place as the purveyor of ethnic and racial stereotypes and how the power of narrative can become the heart of recovery by addressing racial, ethnic, and gender inequities through the stories we choose to tell now. Our first guest needs little introduction. Recognized around the world, actor, performer, activist, and co-host of ABC talk show The View, where she guides conversation across American politics, race relations, popular culture, and everyday life. Oscar, Emmy, Grammy, and Tony Award winner and Academy Governor Whoopi Goldberg. Hello. Our next guest is Brian Stevenson. Brian is a graduate of both Harvard Law School and Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government. In 1989, he founded the Equal Justice Initiative and remains its executive director. EJI is based in Alabama and focuses on social justice, human rights, and criminal justice reform in the United States. He has argued five cases at the Supreme Court and won four. His book, Just Mercy, A Story of Justice and Redemption, is the basis for the 2019 film, Just Mercy, that profiles wrongfully accused death row victim, Walter McMillan. Please welcome Brian Stevenson. It's great to be with you. Actually, you want to jump in? You want to just jump right into it? Brian? Let's do it. <laughs> well, you know, in listening to all the things that you've been doing, I want to know just from you, how do you think we got here yeah. at this particular moment? It's a really important question because I don't think we've done a very good job in this country of educating people about the history of America. And um, we are a country that has been corrupted by a history of racial injustice. I believe we're not really free because we haven't talked about the things that have created this environment. We have a history of racial inequality that is so uh, uh, toxic that you can still feel it and see it in the air. There's a smog in the atmosphere. And so I believe that we really have to educate ourselves about the fact that we're a post-genocide society. I think what happened to native people when Europeans came to this continent was a genocide. We killed millions of indigenous people through famine and war and disease, but we never acknowledged that violence. We kept their words, half the states in America are native words, but we made those people leave and we took their land. We created a constitution that talked about equality and justice for all, but it excluded these populations. And that narrative of racial difference that we created to justify that violence is what then gave rise to two and a half centuries of slavery. And the thing that I've been trying to emphasize with people is that I don't think the true evil of American slavery was involuntary servitude and forced labor. I think the real evil of slavery was the narrative we created that black people aren't as good as white people, that black people aren't fully human, that black people are less deserving, less evolved, less human. And that's a terribly destructive narrative to create for a whole race of people. And we fight the Civil War and uh, the 13th Amendment is passed to end bondage, but it doesn't address that fundamental narrative, that ideology of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Cause of that, I don't think, you know, slavery ends in 1865, I think it evolves. And then we see a century of uh, lynching and terrorism and segregation and racism and racial hierarchy. And we've never really focused on overcoming that narrative, confronting this ideology of white supremacy, dealing with the damage created by 400 years uh, of, of racist thinking. And because we haven't done that, we now live in a moment where black and brown people are presumed dangerous or guilty. You can be a talented Oscar winning actress or actor, but if you're black, you will go places where you're gonna to have to navigate presumptions of dangerousness and guilt. And that's why so many people are out on the streets today, because when you have to live like that, yeah. no matter how much you've accomplished, no matter what you've done, no matter how much study you've done, when you still have to go places and be presumed dangerous and guilty because of your color, yeah. it gets exhausting. You get tired. And a lot of us are feeling the weight of that history, that exhaustion, and we want things to change. Yeah. And I think that's how we got here. We got here by being silent about our history, about ignoring and denying the past that is so fundamentally undermined and compromised our present. 
And that's why I do believe this is a moment where we're going to have to reckon with that history, talk about native genocide, talk about slavery, talk about lynching, talk about segregation, talk about uh, racial inequality, talk about police violence, talk about narrative failures in Hollywood and entertainment, talk about all of these things to create a new understanding and a new, under, uh, new commitment to what it means to live in a just society. Well, one of the interesting things for me is whenever I watch television as a kid, you know, there were narratives that were there that are, you know, they're in me, you yeah. know, because that's what you saw. So you just assume, why would they lie? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> why, you know, <laughs> must have been like this. What was it? And then suddenly you start to learn that secondary history that people don't talk about. Uh, a lot of my friends who are Italian have no idea that one of the largest lynchings in the United States of America was of Italians. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Irish, my Irish friends, they don't have a, a real full understanding that they too were looked upon, looked down upon. And if we start talking about, you know, the indigenous people here, you know, these are all, these are all narratives that have been shifted and changed and moved around. And it's why, you know, adults, people my age, kind of look at things and kind of go, well, where am I? You yeah. know, where am I in this? I think people older than me probably thought about it, but not the same way. You know, I love, yeah. I love surf movies and I never, we're not even walking past on it. <laughs> you know, we, we're not anywhere, you know, and it's, or the, the where the boys are. Well, where were the boys that I was looking for? <laughs> That's right. Because, we're all going through the same thing, but it looks like we're not present. That's right. And those narrative choices for me are really important because when you, when you tell a story like that, when you make a film like that, you're making choices. And when you're excluding whole populations, you're saying something about the worth and value of those populations. Uh, you, you know, throughout the first half of the 20th century, thousands of Black people were pulled out of their homes. They were beaten, they were drowned, they were hanged, they were tortured. And these lynchings that would sometimes attract a thousand or 5,000 white people, and they would be happening on the courthouse lawn. And our law enforcement agencies and the federal government said nothing and did nothing. So when you tell stories uh, about that era and you don't talk about that phenomenon, it's almost as if the lives of Black people are irrelevant to the first half of the 20th century. We made all of these stories in films. I grew up watching these cowboy westerns, and Native people were presented as villains, yeah. uh, ruthless. Always. Uh, they never had uh, full identities and characters. And we were reinforcing this narrative of racial difference, this idea that Native people and Indigenous people, they're not like us. They're not fully human. They're not to be valued. And that choice gives support to this history. And so now we're having to reckon with all of that miseducation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, is a, there are two statues. One, one was in Central Park, one is outside the Capitol in Alabama of this man named Marion Sims. He was a doctor in medical schools. They frequently referred to him as the father of gynecology. Yeah. And what he did in, in, in Central Alabama in the 1850s was experiment on black women he didn't believe that black people felt pain. So he would actually pull these black women and start cutting on their bodies and they would be writhing and screaming in agony. And, and he thought they were pretending. And he made these discoveries about, um, about uh, the birth process that he could then use and, and provide some better outcomes for white women. And because of those better outcomes, he was hailed as uh, this medical hero. And there's a statue of him in Central Park. There's a statue of him in front of the Alabama Capitol. Well, the truth is, is that he was horrific. He tortured black women. He was uh, experimented on black bodies and it was completely dishonorable what he did. Mm -hmm. And you cannot honor someone who did something dishonorable. So the statue has come down in Central Park, but just a few years ago, right. and our statue is still outside of our Capitol. When you begin to understand these histories, you think differently about what's honorable. And we've honored things in our films and our stories and in our TV program that we should have never honored. We should have been more honest about yeah. what those people represented. And also, you know, it doesn't help when you have people in makeup playing those folks. Now, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. it, it, and you think to yourself, well, were there no Native American? You couldn't find anybody? 
Yeah. You know, you, the Jay Selver heels didn't know, you know, and to, because when you start to tell the narrative as it is, it, it, it becomes an imbalance. Yes. Because it started out that way. You yeah. know, it's never been a balanced playing field. Not ever. Not for yeah, Native yeah. Americans, not for all the Asian folks who came over to work in this country. It's never been equal or balanced. Yeah. And when I look at what's happening now, people are saying, listen, you can tell me who you think your heroes are, but I'm here and been here long enough to tell you your heroes may not be my heroes and so i want to i want a part of the conversation and i think that's what people are doing and have been doing over the last you know 10 15 years with cinema you know mm -hmm. people you know want to be present they want to be part of the cinema that's happening without the the sort of ideas that people have thrown out from time to time, like, you know, well, if you have a whole bunch of folks of color in a movie, you know, it's not going to sell overseas. Actually, <laughs> they do. Yes. And I'm perfect example. Oh, I'm right. higher there than here. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and what people don't appreciate is it's, it's funny because it's such a misguided notion. Uh, in World War I, when Black soldiers went to uh, France and Germany, they were embraced, they were celebrated. Black veterans got more recognition, uh, more applause, uh, more acknowledgement for what they did during World War I in Europe than they ever did in, in this country. When they came back from World War I wearing their uniforms, they were actually targeted for violence. And we have a report that talks about the high rate of lynchings of Black veterans after World War I because white Southerners didn't want them to believe that they were now somebody because they had fought. But their European experience actually challenged the idea that they were less than their white uh, uh, compatriots. The same thing happens in World War II. And throughout the 1950s and 60s, actually black artists would go to Europe because yeah. they felt like that was a space where they could, they could avoid or at least uh, minimize some of the bar burdens and barriers. So this idea that you can't tell stories about people of color that are going to be embraced or understood in the international markets is a very confusing one when you actually look at the history of international and European responses to the black experience. And I, I do think it's so important what you said about the absence of diversity. I mean, you couldn't have made those films about cowboys and Indians if you had real uh, native uh, people on set because they would be challenging these portrayals. They would complicate the ease with which these stories are being told. And I think so much of that would be true uh, for, for black people as well. And this is funny because I talked to my friends and they'll say whenever they see these stories that are supposed to be about the experience of women, mm -hmm. <laughs> because I can tell there were no women involved in that story making. <laughs> no women were involved in the creative process because the story doesn't ring true to the lives of women. And that's why diversity and inclusion is such a critical component of how we begin changing these narratives. You know, people talk about diversity, but a lot of times they just want women and people of color who think and act just like they do to be in the room. They want a different color to the room, they want a different gender to the room, but they don't want different thinking. Yes. We're not gonna to get to the just society unless we open our minds and our hearts to the idea that as things diversify, things change. The thinking's going to change, the conversation's going to change, the storytelling's going to change. It's gonna be more authentic and honest and realistic and informed. And that's the power of diversity at this moment in all sectors, but certainly in the storytelling sector. It's an interesting word, diversity, yeah. because people throw it out. They say, yes, you know, we want to be diverse. But I don't know that people really understand what that actually means, you know, yeah. because when you say to someone, well, if you had diversity here in your newsroom, someone might have said, you know, we don't need to watch another eight minute segment of this man dying. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Because he's got family, you know, so where you have people who are saying, wait, wait, we know we're trying to tell this story, but we have now shown this over and over and over and over and over. So I, I need you to figure out another way for us to continue to do it. It's little, it's little things. And I, I think it's little things for, for women that women would think of that a guy just would not. Yeah, you know, yeah. Things yeah. People of color will recognize and see 
I've seen that. And I, I, I need to do this. We need to do this differently. They're just little tweaks that people can help make. Yeah. Why do you think, why do you think people are afraid uh, to really have this conversation? What is it that really is scaring people? Yeah, I think, you know, we have practiced silence for so long that when people start saying the things that, that you know, haven't been said before, it, it unnerves people. And I think, you know, I do think uh, people are afraid. We've got um, politicians who have governed uh, through the politics of fear and anger. And uh, we've been taught, many of us, that if, if that happens, something bad will happen to you. If that happens, something bad, you know, we got into mass incarceration in the 1970s because we had politicians that were preaching fear and anger. Uh, and they said, we need a war on drugs because people who are drug addicted and drug dependent, they're dangerous. We're gonna treat them as criminals. Now we could have said that people dealing with addiction and dependency have a health problem. We need a healthcare response. We don't have to be afraid. We just have to be effective. But that politics of fear and anger was very powerful. I think fear and anger are the essential ingredients of injustice and inequality. And we've done a lot of that in this country. When you look at the history of slavery, and even the history of what happens to indigenous, oh, you have to be afraid of indigenous people, native people, they'll kill you. You have to be afraid of black men, they'll do all of these terrible things. It was this fear of full equality that shaped that. And that's why those lynchings were so powerful and potent. We can't let our children go to school with black kids because that wouldn't be safe and healthy. And I think that as we begin now to tell the truth about this history, we have to just have courage. There are therapy, it's interesting when you think about the elements of therapy, uh, whether you're dealing with addiction, alcoholism, drug addiction, whatever, the first thing you have to do is to be willing to tell the truth about who you are. 12 Steps works only works when you're prepared to say, I'm an alcoholic, right. I'm an addict. And then you begin to tell the truth of what that means in your life. And that truth telling is an essential part of the process. And what we have to have the courage to have in this country is to admit that we are a nation shaped by racism and bigotry. We are a post-genocide society. We've done horrific things. We are slave society. We were a society that perpetrated racial terrorism. The black people uh, that are in the North and the West are consequences of this era of terror. Between uh, 1900 and 1950, millions of black people fled the American South. And we haven't acknowledged the fact that the black people in Cleveland and Chicago and Detroit and Los Angeles and Oakland and New York and Boston didn't go to those communities as uh, immigrants looking for new economic opportunities, they went to those communities as refugees and exiles from terror in the American South. And we haven't talked about it. And so older black people come up to me and they say, Mr. Stevenson, I get angry when I hear somebody say that we're dealing with domestic terrorism for the first time in our nation's history after 9-11. They said, we grew up with terror. We had to worry about being bombed and lynched and menaced every day of our life. And because we have this fear that if we're honest about the past, it'll be painful and difficult. We try to avoid it. But the reality is, is what every therapeutic intervention that's effective that I know tells us is that it's only when we're honest that we get better. It's through truth telling that we can actually begin to understand how to cope with our addictions, our dependency, uh, our abuse. I mean, an abuse center, a lot of time for the first half of the 20th century, you said people who were sex abuse victims and child abuse victims should never talk about it. And that's not healthy. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what we have to get people to understand is that if we have the courage to tell the truth, I mean, I'm from a faith tradition in my church, you know, you can't just walk in and say, I want heaven and all that good stuff. I want all of that redemption and salvation. They'll tell you, well, you first have to repent. You have to confess. You cannot be afraid to tell the truth of what you've done and who you are. Right. Once you do that, on the other side is redemption and restoration and uplift and all of these things. And part of what I'm trying to do in our work is to tell people, I don't wanna talk about the native genocide and slavery and lynching and segregation because I wanna punish America. I wanna talk about these things because I want to liberate us. I want us to get to something else. And, and I really believe that there's something better waiting for us. I think there is something that feels more like freedom, that feels more like equality, that feels more like justice. There are better movies to be made. There are better stories to be mm -hmm. told. There's a kind of future for this industry that energizes all people because it tells all of those stories. But to get there, we're gonna to have to be honest about the ways we have failed, the ways we have undermined truth-telling, 
and then give truth to that. And for me, truth and justice is sequential. People want to skip to the reconciliation, they want to skip to the reparation without telling the truth. It doesn't work like that. It's only when we tell the truth that we have a consciousness that allows us to repair the damage, to uh, restore confidence, yeah. to build healthy relationships. And I'm going to ask this question, and I, uh, I, I hope it's taken in the spirit that I ask it. What do we need to help people, white people understand? Because I feel like white people are very nervous. Yeah. They're very nervous. Do we need to, because sometimes I feel like you should know this. <laughs> I should not be walking you through this. And then I realize that unless a lot of this has touched you in your life, you're not going to be thinking about it the way that I am. You're not going to notice where I am not. Yeah. So what, what can we do to help people who are not people of color, who yeah. are not women, yeah. who are, you know, who are white people or white yeah. men? How, yeah. how do we help them walk through this storm? Because it is a storm. Yeah. Yeah, well, this is where I think actually Hollywood and film and media have a critical role to play. Because what this industry can do, which very few industries can do, is to invite people into a space and in a couple of hours tell a story that radically shifts their thinking. So, I, and I've seen that just because my book was turned into a movie. The movie came out in January. I've gotten thousands and thousands of emails and letters from people who were saying, I'm a 57 year old white man. I'm a 70 year old white. I did not understand mm -hmm. the problems that were being created by our criminal justice. And they desperately now want to do something. And they just saw a movie and then they want to read a book. And now they want to see other things. You know, storytelling is a powerful way to invite people into a conversation that wouldn't ordinarily get there. And we've done it over and over again. I think about domestic violence, for example. And your, your question will be about white men. It's a, it's a particularly compelling one. You know, we didn't have a healthy attitude about women who were experiencing violence in the home uh, throughout most of the 60s and 70s. Yeah. We were indifferent to that victimization. We didn't, we, we blamed people for being in relationships where they were being abused. We joked about domestic violence. There used to be a show, you remember the Jackie Gleason show at the end of that show, mm -hmm. uh, he'd say, to the moon, Alice, and everybody would laugh. And that threat of violence wasn't something that uh, we saw problematic. And then we started telling stories that actually took the perspective of abused women. And Farrah Fawcett Majors made that movie, The Burning Bed, yeah. showed the role of that. And then all of a sudden, people who were being abused started lifting their voices and the narrative began to shift and you could no longer ignore the pain and anguish and suffering connected to that kind of violence and victimization. You know, Mothers Against Drunk Driving organized in the 80s to create a new relationship to driving while drunk. You know, we didn't punish people who were intoxicated while driving. We would pat them, you know, depending on their status, we might not even arrest them or give them a ticket. We didn't, we didn't deal with it. But when Mothers Against Drunk Driving started using narrative to tell painful stories about the children they lost uh, because of our inability to confront that problem, the narrative shifted. And today, uh, you know, we're seeing uh, consequences of that. You can be a celebrity or athlete if there's a credible allegation of domestic violence, you are going to be held accountable in ways that you would not have been held accountable even 10 years ago. And that's a narrative shift. We wouldn't have marriage equality in this country if we hadn't started telling stories that got people who didn't want to hear about yeah. sex relationships to now be in stories where that became a part of it. And that's why I think that, that Hollywood has a critical role to play in addressing uh, this long history of silence about racial inequality, this long history of silence about racism and bigotry and racial hierarchy. You know, I look at the catalog of films and stories that we have about the Holocaust, which are so vital. We need more of them because clearly anti-Semitism is still a problem. Yep. We have a whole catalog of stories. And I've seen a hundred films about that experience and I wanna see more, but we have so few in the catalog of films and storytelling about the brutality of slavery, about the era of lynching, mm -hmm. uh, about the pain and suffering of segregation. And, and, and I think until we fix that, until we correct that, these are American stories that have never been told. We just put out a report about reconstruction in America. Horrific time between 1865, 1876, 2000 black people are lynched, lawlessness reigns, the federal government retreats, 
from helping formerly enslaved people. It's probably the most critical 12 year period in American history. And you can't count on one hand the number of uh, committed uh, narratives, films, stories, programs that have dealt honestly with that era. And until we fix that, we're going to, and I think that's what we can do. I think we can invite reluctant, cautious viewers and people who don't want to get, to step into a space and then hear some things and see some things and live through the characters in ways that get them to come out on the other side uh, now in a different place. I've seen it happen with Just Mercy. I saw it happen with The Color Purple. I remember yeah. seeing The Color Purple uh, in the South uh, and there were people all around me, white viewers, who were very hesitant. They were told it was a great movie, but they weren't so sure if they wanted to. And you know, there were those scenes and they were crying just like everybody else at the end of that film. And it changed their perspective on what it meant to live in that region with this population of black people who were marginalized and excluded and oppressed. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of, of, of effective storytelling. And that's why I do think Hollywood has a critical role to play and addressing that very problem that you articulate, which is how do we get to people who are very hesitant, who are reluctant? We get to them by going to their spaces, their living rooms, their movie theaters, the places where they consume entertainment and getting them exposed to these realities. And is it also making people aware of you know, we have a lot of movies about American history. We have a ton of movies about American history, but it's only half of the story. It's That's only right. a quarter of the story. Yeah. All of these amazing films that people have made from time in memoriam, from the very first Lincoln uh, in Illinois to the, to the newest Lincoln that was made. This is a, a big portion of American history, but there are other portions of American history that you also need to know in order not to recreate them in real life. Yeah, and is, I, that, is, is that a way to help people understand that absolutely. these stories are ours? They're not just yeah. black, they're not black stories, they're American stories. Well, it's like telling, it's like making 50 films about World War II mm -hmm. and addressing the Holocaust. It's incomplete. It almost becomes dishonest to make films about the battles and the soldiers fighting on the field and never acknowledge or mention the Holocaust. Yeah. If it's just dishonest. And, and we've done that in America with a lot of our storytelling. Uh, we'll tell stories about mid 19th century history and never talk about slavery. Yeah. Or do it in such a marginal way that it seems as some peripheral issue. And if that's what you're seeing in the stories you hear, yes, see, that's what you think. We tell stories about World War I. We tell stories about the first half of the 20th century as if um, we're living in this place where there isn't all of this terror and violence going on. And so, yes, I do think it becomes dishonest to tell these stories without being uh, open to and committed to yeah. acknowledging all the elements of it. And I just think, you know, again, we oftentimes, a lot of storytelling is, well, what do people want to hear? We're only going to tell the stories that people want to hear. And that's how we make money, is we just give people what they want. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the film industry, we have actually rejected that many times. I mean, we started telling, uh, people started making movies that pushed back against the bigotry toward LGBTQ people. We, we started making movies that pushed back against this idea that women were just ornaments uh, yeah. in the household. And, and, and it was courageous, but it was necessary. And it ultimately was very effective and very successful. And now I actually think there's a real hunger to understand the world in which we live we have to match that appetite with the kind of storytelling. I, you know, I do think as an advocate, I know I can't go into a courtroom and just demand things and say, I want this and I believe, I've got to go where people are. Yeah. But I go there with a mission of, of, of leading them to someplace I think we all need to be that's healthier. And that's why we're doing a lot of the work you know, that we do. We have a project where we're actually, we have memos that talk about uh, white Southerners that were abolitionists that tried mm -hmm. to end slavery. We have a memo that talks about white Southerners that were opposed to lynching and tried to prevent these right. incidents of racial terror. There were white people who were actually working to end a racial segregation. And if I took that memo and read out some of those names, mostly nobody in the country would know any of those yeah. names. Yeah. And I'm saying to folks, we don't have to make false monuments to people who experimented on black women mercilessly or people who perpetrated and defended slavery or people who were violent misogynists, we don't have to have monuments to them to have a history that we can be proud of. 
yeah. there are these other people who did these honorable things. And that's the kind of thing that storytelling can do. You know, I, I, the film about the, the black women who participated in uh, the Nassau launch with John Clint. I mean, that, those stories, yeah. uh, that story was made and, and new characters are introduced to the American consciousness has yeah. a profound impact on how we think about the lives of black women and the value that black women can bring to everything. But without those stories, that doesn't happen. And also, I, you know, you, we're talking about, you know, World War I and World War II. And when you think about how many folks of color fought in both of those wars, came home and could not walk on the sidewalk. That's I mean, right. for me, if you're going to tell us history of World War II, there are a lot of people fighting in World War II. There are a lot of people who discovered what was going on in Nazi Germany. And several of the, the Black uh, details were the guys who first walked into places like Auschwitz. These, this is a story that's never been told. We are, in a way, held apart, you know? Like, we, yeah. weren't, we weren't there. We weren't fighting. And yeah. I feel like a lot of what is happening is young folks don't really know the history because they think of it as being something so long ago. You know, they, they're not aware of our part in this country, you know, or the Native Americans part in this country, what these folks did, what we did to fight for a nation that did not have enough time to show us a modicum of respect. And in fact, you know, hung us because they were mad that we, you know, we wear medals and stuff. So those conversations, those yeah. films, and, yeah. and those are important and need to be done. You know, they yeah. need to be done. There's a, a great book called Destined to Witness Growing Up Black in Nazi Germany. Yeah. Extraordinary book. Uh, yeah. Uh, and we had it for a while. And when we'd bring it to people, people would say, well, what's the hook? Hmm. It's like, what? What? what okay. Okay. <laughs> you know, because it's like, if you don't, if you can't figure out the hook, I don't know how to explain it to you. Yeah. Or you, yeah. you want to say hey there's a lot of there's a lot to be learned from black performers yeah. you know in the earlier part of the century there's yeah. a lot to be learned there's a lot to be learned from native american comics i mean it's just you know asian comics and latin comics and you know we're all here trying to tell these stories and how do we how do we get these conversations going and get past the verbiage that makes it sound, it sounds good, but you know they not, nothing's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, yeah, I think you're, I mean, it's so, I mean, I think it's really in the richness of the narrative and, and you, you've just characterized it so, so wonderfully. I mean, all of these stories, you have hundreds of thousands of black people who go fight for an America that won't let them vote that won't let them go through the front door, that won't respect their basic dignity, that won't pay them fairly, but they put on a uniform to go fight for that nation with the hope that if they show courage and bravery, they'll be accepted. And then they come back and they get to the train station in some town where white people will say, take that uniform off uh, because you don't deserve to. And they're humiliated by these mobs. And, uh, we, we tell the stories of all of these black veterans that are lynched and beaten and abused because they keep their uniform on. And there's so much important drama mm -hmm. and important truth telling in a story like that, um, that we haven't explored, we haven't talked about. You know, uh, you, know you talk about the native uh, contributions, uh, the code breakers and all of that, and we'll hint at it and we'll right. make a question, but we haven't actually dealt honestly with that that legacy as well. And I think part of it is, you know, truth can be powerful. Overcoming obstacle can be powerful. No matter what your background is, uh, a story about perseverance, a story about people who have courage, who stand up when everybody says sit down, who speak when everybody says be quiet, a story like that can inspire everybody, not just people who are part of that community. And we haven't actually tapped in uh, to the power of storytelling the power of inspirational storytelling, power of uh, power, you know, these incredible stories. 
by denying or not allowing ourselves to tell stories about this community or that community or these kinds of difficult topics. And I, I just think that's got to be part of the equation. We've got to have the courage of our convictions, but because Hollywood and story filmmakers have, are responsible for a lot of the false ideas, a lot of the bigotry, a lot of that racial hierarchy, I think we have an obligation to do it and to be courageous and to push it. And I just think that's gotta be part of the mix too. I, you know, I, you know, I came up again, my faith tradition is, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. Uh, you know, Hollywood, this industry has a, has a central platform across the globe. Uh, yeah. People, we all love movies, we all love stories, we all love engaging, and, and, we, and that's an opportunity to do some things. And I just think with that uh, op opportunity, with all of those resources and, and spaces, we have an obligation to kind of push some things. And I don't think we should think about it as, as co corruptive or anything like, I just think it's truth telling. And we're, I'm seeing these new sets of stories about uh, challenging the way um, people in Hollywood were targeted during the McCarthy era. And there's a narrative now about the victimization that took place by the excess of government oversight and that victory. And once you begin to understand it, it positions you differently when people start making unfair judgments about people in this industry today. Right. Right. And building that consciousness is how we protect ourselves from repeating the sins of the past. And I just think we haven't done that enough when it comes to racism, when it comes to bias, the beautiful thing about the love, all that wonderful uh, storytelling around the Holocaust. You know, I go to the Holocaust Museum, I go through it, it's so powerful. And at the end of it, I'm motivated to say, never again. Yeah. And I look yeah. for cultural spaces that talk honestly about the history of slavery and lynching and segregation, and I can't find them. Yeah. And until we create those spaces and we create those stories that motivate us at the end to say, never again can we tolerate this kind of bigotry. Yeah. We're going to be vulnerable to the problems that we're seeing today. I mean, I, I and I, I'm, I look around and I think, where are the LGBTQ stories? Where, mm -hmm. where are those stories which we need to know because people know who they are at when they're little. So why aren't we supporting that and allowing films to be made that will help? young people through that will give us some other visual of the LGBTQ community other than as the comic relief. Yeah. You know, yeah. these yeah. are these are really important. And I always get in trouble because people always say, well, you never include women. I, I do include women, but I don't include all women. You know, because for me, there was always someone who was going to win best actress. Mm -hmm. Always, she was always going to be. Right. But Hattie McDaniel was the first one of color to win, you know, and she won Best Supporting. But yeah. women excelled. White women seem to have had a an upper hand for the longest time. Yeah. But even as we look at that, as we see the, you know, what we've had to pay for, because there are not a whole bunch of female directors or producers or, and there should be, there should be given how many women were working in the twenties, thirties, forties, there should be a plethora and there's not. So clearly yeah. there's a problem. Yeah. And, and I do think this is one of the things I've been pushing. I think institutions and industries like the film industry could gain something, mm -hmm. making a formal commitment to truth telling. So we're gonna actually have a period of time where we're gonna create a process where we're gonna just be honest about the ways that we failed yeah. to confront racism. We failed to confront um, truth telling right. around the experience of, of, of LGBTQ2P. And, and you can point to a whole catalog of films that really perpetrated a kind of violence against these communities by the way they told stories. Mm. And I think it's worth talking about that. I actually don't think it's a waste of time to engage in that kind of reflection and the barriers that were created that barred opportunities for women directors and women producers and producers and directors of color. You had to be so exceptional and so extraordinary to have any chance at all to direct right. a film if you're, if you're a black person or if you're, all of those things are things I think we can talk about and should talk about because once we put it all out there, the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa was critical to that nation's recovery right. from apartheid. 
and, and victims of apartheid could come in and, and speak what happened to them and it would be emotional, but it made them feel differently about the future that they had that opportunity. Yeah. And the perpetrators had to speak to that as well. In Rwanda, after the genocide, they recognized that they couldn't heal. Yeah. If they didn't create a process for people to talk honestly about the pain and suffering of seeing your whole family or your whole village right. slaughtered. Yeah. And then for perpetrators to give voice to what was going through their head and to, it, it allowed people to feel differently. I look at Germany today, and I wouldn't go to Germany uh, if uh, they didn't acknowledge the Holocaust, if they weren't committed. And you can't go 200 meters in Berlin without seeing markers and stones that have been placed next to the homes of Jewish families that were abducted during the Holocaust. There's that beautiful Holocaust memorial in the center of Berlin and cab drivers and hotel operators encourage you to go there. Every police officer in Germany has to go to the Holocaust sites, every student has to go. There are no Adolf Hitler statues in Germany. No. It would be unconscionable for someone and to say, the flag okay. is not there. It's exactly. Not, it's not waving and people aren't flying all the places. It, that. In fact, the swastika is banned. Yes. The nationalist movement that is trying to emerge there, they're using the Confederate flag from America as their <laughs> symbol. Which but, is I, but, but the idea that they would have a monument to, the, to an architect, the third, it's so unconscionable. But you come to this country, and our landscape is littered with yeah. the iconography of the defenders and perpetrators of slavery. Yeah. And that's a function of the truth telling we have failed to do. And that's, that's to me the beauty of this is that on the other side of this, something really extraordinary can happen. So they're telling me that we're moments away from questions. Okay. Which uh, I'm excited to, to see and hear. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> I think Sean uh, is going to put questions up that people may have. Um, are you? Are you? So while I'm waiting for that, I, I will ask: Are you? Are you optimistic about the future? Truly, I am. I am. And and for me, being hopeful is a necessary element of this work. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think hopelessness is the enemy of justice. Because when you become hopeless, you, you accept mm -hmm. things, you don't fight, you don't tolerate things. I think injustice prevails where hopelessness persists. So for me, it's an orientation, it's an obligation to stay hopeful. But I'm genuinely hopeful because I'm seeing some things that I haven't seen before. I'm seeing this broad coalition of people speaking about these issues. I'm seeing companies uh, responding to this. Even from five years ago, I'm seeing mm -hmm. things that I didn't see in 2015 and 2014. And that encourages me uh, but yeah, I am hopeful. I, and I live in Montgomery, Alabama, and it's hard to, uh, to not be hopeful when you think about the generation that came before. And you've been here and you've made that amazing movie about the boycott. But when I think about the Black folks in this community uh, who did so much more with so much less, mm -hmm. a community of people who didn't have legal institutions to protect them, who didn't have money to get bailed out, didn't have all of these things, and yet they would put on their Sunday best, yeah. and they would go places and demand the right to vote and, and fight for the right to be treated fairly. And they knew they'd get bloodied and battered and beaten, but they went anyway. Yeah. When I think about the kind of courage that, that took, I realize that I'm standing on their shoulders. Absolutely. And standing on their shoulders, I don't have the choice to say, oh, this is too hard, this is too much, I gotta give up. I just feel like it is an obligation yeah you know, to keep fighting. And so, uh, yes, I am hopeful about what we can do and about what we can achieve in this moment. I just want to keep pushing. I want to make sure it's not a moment, but a movement, that we actually begin a process where, uh, you know, 12 years from now, we can say, look at what we've done over the last 12 years to get to a different right. place. That's what I'd love to see. I'd love to see a whole catalog of films and stories and movies 12 years from now that you and I could point to mm -hmm. this new body of work that has helped us get people to understand the challenges that we face. Well, the, the, one of the great things about all of this is people are, you know, people talk about being woke. Mm -hmm. I say, you may be woke now, that's because we let you sleep. Yeah, yeah, See? that's right. So now everybody's up and the key is we have to stay up. We have to stay on top of this. And this is gonna be slow going. It's not yeah. an easy thing to do, but I feel like people are open to the conversation. They're open to hearing, how can I make it better? What, I need to change the name of the team? Yes, you do. <laughs> yes. You no, know, yes, right. you do. That's and right. Seeing that was like, okay, something <laughs> clearly is happening. <laughs>
<laughs> that, that's right. Because it's always been clear to some of us that that's an offensive name, but to yeah. recognize that's good. But it yeah. isn't good. Yeah, but it's nice to hear that they say they want to stop. So, Sean, I see that you are about to jump on this. So, I am here, Whoopi. <laughs> right, thank, you, thank you, Whoopi and Brian both. This is such a such an amazing conversation. Literally could listen for hours. I want to get to some of our member questions. Okay. Um, the first one is for the both of you. How can we at the Academy collect and present evidence, not just words, but actual numbers to the media financiers that films with black, brown, LGBTQ cast and stories do not inhibit good box office? Well, it seems to me you just have to, you have to show people. I mean, you know, you, you have enough evidence that people are interested in these stories because they are the story, they're the universal stories. These are not specific to America. These are not just American stories. These are stories that exist everywhere in the world. And you put everything else out. I don't know why you wouldn't <laughs> take a shot on some of these stories. Well, so I'm yeah. sorry, Brian. No, no, no. I just, I mean, as a, it's something of a bit of an outsider on this. I am struck by why there has to be this higher burden of proof when it comes to uh, the value of these other stories. I mean, why? You know, Black Panther made more money uh, than any Marvel film uh, before it. It yeah. kind of smashed records. It was an international hit. And yet there's still this skepticism because people, they just have a hard time reconciling themselves with this re reality. Uh, the, the films that have had critical success, uh, films like Moonlight, films like 12 Years a Slave, are, are, are stories that ordinarily you'd see a lot of people trying to replicate that because they want that same critical success, yeah. but want that same kind of financial success. But it's almost as if, uh, you know, the industry sometimes says, oh, well, we did Black Panther, so we don't have to do anything again for another right. five or 10 years, or we right. did that film. And I think that has, that's really the problem. I don't think it's a finance proof number as much as it's an orientation number. These are American stories. If we want to tell the story of America, we have to tell all of these stories. Yeah. And there's never been a shortage or an unwillingness to tell the, an American story, but we just have to now open that, that lens. And uh, I mean, I think the data is there, uh, but more than the data, I, I just think there has to be an orientation that these stories have value. Yes, they have value at the box office, but they have even broader value beyond that. And can I add something to that? Because it would also be helpful if people recognized who is inhabiting the world. Mm. It's not like we're not everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we are all over the world. You know, you, you'd be surprised to find out how many different ethnicities that look like all the ethnicities you see here uh, are living all over the world. So these stories they are connected and you know if we make them we'll know if they work and how well they work it's just yeah. you got somebody's got to make the step thank you both the next question is do you believe for the both of you do you believe that it is more or less difficult for black or people of color filmmakers to break into genre filmmakers example rom-coms horror sci-fi fantasy action etc Um, I, I don't know because I, the, you know, ask John Peel, you know, he seemed to, he seemed to make the movies he wants to make, you know, what the question is, is, is there money? Is anybody, are there giant vats of money someplace for filmmakers who want to do that? You know, that's, I feel that's been a lot of filmmakers problems because, you know, if you go to some of the bigger places, they say, well, we have to own everything. You know, you don't, <laughs> you're already in, in deep do yeah. before you even start because you're just trying to get some money to make your movie. If it was as uh, prevalent as it seems to be for so many other folks, I think that would, that would answer that question better than I could. Money is what is at the root of getting stuff made, I feel. Yeah, and can I just add, I, I mean, I actually think when you look at the history of filmmaking and storytelling in America throughout the 20th century, the industry failed uh, to actually invite voices in to tell complete stories, to tell uh, truthful stories about our experience in this country. And when you have failed 
and you have denied, uh, you didn't do what you were supposed to do, you should want to repair that. You should want to remedy that. And you should actually make it a commitment to invest in corrections to that and let that lead you. I mean, you know, I just don't think that we should assume that the playing field is level now and uh, we're just going to see use the same tactics and strategies we've used before. I've been, you know, in the 1960s, you know, what we've done in this country when it comes to justice and rights is like, it's different than what we do in other areas of the law. In law school, I had to study damages uh, for tort violations and contract violations, corporate. There's treble damages and, and a punitive damages. We have a very elaborate construct of what people are obligated to pay when they have violated someone's rights. But in the human rights and the civil rights context, it's almost as if we say, all we want you to do is to stop violating their rights and you don't have to do anything else. And I think that's left us vulnerable to failing to appreciate our obligations to do more to repair the damage that we did. I think in 1965, after these states had denied black people the right to vote for 100 years, states like Alabama and Mississippi shouldn't have just been told you can't do that anymore. I actually think that black people should have been automatically registered to vote in those states. I don't think that would have been wrong. It would have been a repair for the damage that was done. I don't think it would have been wrong to say to the University of Georgia and Mississippi, you've got to let black kids who are qualified to attend these universities attend for free because you've got to do something to repair the damage that you did by excluding black people for so long. And so this industry, I think, is not, it would not be wrong for this industry to say, you know, we're going to commit a, a percentage of our resources to create platforms for uh, black uh, uh, storytellers and producers and directors and people of color and people whose voices have been historically excluded because we now want to say to the world that we want to fix the problem that we helped uh, sustain by our silence. And with that kind of orientation, we can make it easier uh, for directors and producers and storytellers of color to have an opportunity to tell their stories. And what we'll get from that are some amazingly talented people uh, becoming some of our leaders and some of the legends that, that we all want to be in these spaces. I don't think that's the wrong orientation. I think it could actually be a healthy orientation for the industry. That's a great idea too. Thank you. Next question, we have two more. Just Mercy, this is for you, Brian. <laughs> Just Mercy resonates with our experiences with access to justice in my homeland, Kenya. How do we get the critics on board so that they highlight diverse stories? You know, it's interesting. I. I um, you know, I don't, I don't know how to do it. I think one of the things that was fascinating to me, and I didn't understand this, and Whoopi probably has had this experience much more than I have, is that the people who were judging uh, the film initially were people who knew very little about the lived experience. You know, it's like, you know, we played the film and, and Black audiences and white audiences were responding with such enthusiasm. And the, you look at the cinema score for a film like that, it's through the roof. Uh, but but critics, oh, we've seen this before. And I was like, well, where have you seen this? I don't recall any films that actually talk. I, I didn't see it before. I never met a lawyer until I got to Harvard Law School. So a story of Black people just surrounded by lawyers, that wasn't familiar to me. And I think there is a sort of cynicism about it. I remember when The Color Purple came out, I remember reading a review in the Atlanta Constitution by a well-known reviewer and what they said, well, it wasn't, they didn't like parts of the film. They said it was unfair to the white people. No, there were no white heroes in this. They didn't present white people in a very, and it's that kind of orientation that I think we have to confront. You know, the, there's a critical perspective in this country that is shaped by these same narratives that we've been talking about during this conversation. And we have to understand that. And I think people need to be called out. Uh, I remember writing, that was the first time I ever wrote a letter to a film critic is when uh, the, I read that review about the color purple, it wasn't fair to the white, as if somehow white people were doing everything they possibly could in the first half of the 20th century to help black people escape the ravages of, gym, of sharecropping and tenant farming. If anything, it, it understated multiple ways in which uh, white bias and Jim Crow laws could create that kind of narrative. And I just think part of it is shifting who has that platform, just like we need a more diverse uh, uh, community of people making films and producing films and, and uh, st starring in films. We need a, a more diverse platform of people who are evaluating these films and they can speak to the value of this storytelling, you know, and I just, um, I think that's part of it. And I, I'm glad to hear that somebody from uh, Kenya is here because I, I do think these stories are global. 
You know, I've been to Africa and seen the way in which um, access to justice can be a problem in that society. When you hear a story about how you can overcome that and maybe succeed, that's inspiring for everybody. I've gotten some beautiful letters from people in East Africa uh, in response to seeing the film that I was really moved by. And that's the power of effective storytelling. Thank you so much, Brian. And our last question is, uh, we are poor at teaching our history of discrimination. While docs documentaries are good are a good start, how do we encourage filmmakers to eschew creating distorted history or social views in the name of creative choice? Hmm. I'm gonna let you do this one, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, you know I, it's funny. I think there most filmmakers don't want to tell a mo don't want to present a story that they know. Uh, is uh, going to be exposed as false, right? So I, I was in a movie theater one time and they had a character uh, in Mobile, Alabama and they would visit and the actor said, I'm going to Mobile, Alabama and the whole thing <laughs> just started laughing and a bunch of people left because they couldn't trust a film that didn't get that right. And so if we really want to be honest, if we don't want to expose ourselves, it's just being completely, then I think we have to be willing to tell the full story. And, uh, you know, I often think that uh, filmmakers have one kind of viewer in mind. And it's a certain person of a certain race, of a certain demographic group, as if America is only that person. And as Whoopi said, we're going to, you know, we're going to soon be a minority, majority country. There will be more people of color in this country than there are people who identify as white. And I just think when you step back and say, let me think about how uh, young kids of color are going to experience this story or how women are going to experience this story. Then you begin to understand that these so-called creative choices to kind of make it easy and comfortable for people are things that we should push back. The most effective films that I've ever seen, the most moving films, are the films that at times made me uncomfortable because that's what good storytelling does. It actually pushes you. It actually exposes you to things. It's not just something that you take to make you feel good at night. It's sometimes the most powerful filmmaking can push you. We cannot create more justice. We cannot create an, uh, a healthier society if we're unwilling to do things that are uncomfortable and inconvenient. You know, powerful films, you know, I think about films like Schindler's List, at times it's so uncomfortable and so painful. You're, you're worried about what's going to happen. You know, great films, the Fruitvale Station, my friend Ryan Kruger's film, difficult, challenging. But those are the kinds of stories that ultimately lead, stay with you. I can remember those scenes uh, even though I saw the film 20 years ago. If we want to make memorable filmmaking that makes a difference, that lasts, that endures the test of time, then we have to be willing to tell the truth. We have to be willing to do the hard things, even if they're uncomfortable and inconvenient. And I think that ought to be the norm rather than the exception. And I think Hollywood and the big studios have to keep reinforcing their interest in that kind of storytelling by investing in films that tell those stories and not just the simple, easy stories that you can forget about you know, an hour or two after you leave the theater. I also think that it, it would behoove folks who want to tell these stories, who may not be uh, Native American or Black folks, they may be white people who are just invested in the story, team up with folks so that we can help you get them right. We can help you get to the place where you want your story to be. I believe we can do this as a, as a, a coalition, you know, of artists, because, you know, that's what we are. We're artists, whether we're hair artists or light artists, we are all artists in this. And together we can make huge differences, but we've got to cop to the stuff we don't know, yeah. talk about the stuff that really pisses us off or that we don't understand. And, you know, listen, I'm not perfect. I, ha I know I have all kinds of tendencies to snap in my mind when I see somebody and they become that so-and-so, you know, we all have these tendencies. And so we have to fight through them and talk about the fact that we have them and then move forward. I think we can only do it co kind of collectively, yeah. I think, really. Yeah. Brian and Whoopi Goldberg. Thank you both so much for joining, for sharing your truth, your transparency, your light with all of us. Uh, to our members who have been attending from around the world, 
uh, to the Board of Governors and to the incredible Academy staff who put this together. This is just the beginning of what we hope to be a long lasting fruitful conversation about change. Um, thank you for hosting our first Academy Dialogues. We are better because of the both of you. Thank you so very much. Thank, thank you. you.